In the combat phase, you can use one or more of your nobles to attack any enemies in the same land area, never at sea. This is always optional, it's never mandatory. You can carry out as many separate attacks as you wish, and in whatever order you wish. So our fictional player, Oscar, he's got a stack of nobles here, sitting in the field outside Ashby and Coventry. We're in the first turn, so we can't attack Ashby, but on a subsequent turn, absolutely, Ashby's fair game. What's important to know is that there's two types of combat. There's battles and there's sieges. A battle is fought between two nobles out in the open field. A siege is when nobles are attacking a fortified location. And remember, these small little towns are not fortified. You never really occupy these towns. If you're here in Tewkesbury or Daventry, you're actually in the field. We'll look at sieges first because we've got Oscar here attacking with two nobles against a fortified town of Coventry, occupied by no nobles, only by Edward of Westminster. A royal peace doesn't have any troops of its own. A town, as we see here, has an inherent garrison of 200. And to siege attack a fortified location, you must have as many troops in your attacking army as the defenders. As many as or more. So if I had less than 200 troops here, I couldn't attack. I just couldn't do it. Now remember, each fortified location can accommodate an additional number of troops belonging to nobles. Okay, so in a town, it would be a garrison of 200 plus up to 400 units from defending nobles. It could be one of more nobles of a single faction or it could be allied factions. Now then we'll come to allies later, but for now... Just know that royal pieces don't bring any troops. So Coventry is sitting here with no nobles in there. It's just got this inherent garrison of 200. Oscar needs, with his two nobles, 200 or more troops. He's got 100 with the Duke of Suffolk and 100 with Barclay, the Earl of Kent. And Kingmaker, it's that simple. You need as many troops or more to attack. If there were any nobles in here at this point, they could potentially... So let's say Ashby was in there, okay, and they moved into Coventry for some reason during a previous turn. Then they could now, if they've got any crown cards in their hand, we'll come back to this later, they could start adding them to their nobles. They could start adding them to Hastings. Maybe they secretly kept some Scots archers in their hand and um, they go, aha, <laughs> you know, you think you're attacking me, but look, I'm going to play this onto Hastings now. Instead of there being 200 here, there's 210. Well, that could have been a way of breaking the attack. All right. But it goes around. So it starts with a defending player and it goes clockwise around the table because potentially there could be more than one if there's an alliance going on, more than one player involved. But then Pole's faction here, they could go, aha, they've got a crown card in hand and they add it to one of their two nobles and suddenly boost their troop numbers. So there's this little two and forth. You go round and round till everyone's finished playing crown cards and then you reassess. Is the attacker still equal or stronger than the defender? And if they are, then you can proceed. OK, so that's how resolution happens. So up until this point, the, the attack's successful. Right? Nothing's stopping it. There's no dice rolls or anything like that. There's only this little round of adding combat cards that potentially influence in the game. But then there is one little piece of luck because the next step is we have to draw an event card this time we're looking in the black section okay for a siege attack all we're looking for is to ensure it's not bad weather delays attack if you see bad weather delays attack then the siege has been unsuccessful. Anything else and the siege is successful. It's that simple. OK, so either bad weather delays attack or something else. Now, if you do happen to draw bad weather delays attack, it's not that it's failed, but it's not succeeded either. Instead, you place one of these besiege markers on. What it means is this siege has not concluded. Nothing happens. We place a marker on. Coventry is now being besieged. This location, these nobles are tied up 
Remember, fortified besieged locations across roads always block roads. Coventry is not across the road as it goes. That's you can't even choose to let anyone through a besieged location on a road. But also, if there were any nobles inside there, they would be trapped there. Nobles inside a besieged location cannot, for example, be summoned to Parliament or voluntarily attend Parliament. They can't move out of there. They're stuck there. All right, so nobles that are besieged with this marker on. If there were nobles in here, they'd be stuck now. Edward is stuck there. Okay, Edward can't be moved out of there by an event. And you can't add cards to nobles that are stuck there. So if a noble were in Coventry now, that controlling player's faction couldn't add cards to that noble. They couldn't suddenly boost them up with new mercenaries and so on. We'll look at having crown cards in your hand in a little bit, but crown cards in your hand you could normally add to a noble, but not when they're besieged. And if another player wants to have a go at Coventry now, they can't. They first have to have a go at the attacker, the besieger. Okay, so that's what this token's all about. It reminds you of this fact. This location's being sieged by these attackers. Okay. You have to have a go at them. Right? And this only happens, like I say, when bad weather delays an attack. And we get back round to Hull's faction once more. And they could at any time choose to abandon this siege. And if for for some reason their troop numbers got reduced they would have to break the siege and lift the marker. So that's bad weather delays attack. If you don't draw this, then you're good. You're all good. Okay, this doesn't, this stuff here in the bottom is only used for battles in the open field. Now, there is an exception. There's this little section that says killed, Scroop and Holland. We already know the siege is successful, but if these nobles were involved, then at the resolution of the siege, Scroop and Holland, if they were involved, would be killed. All right, we'll come back to that in a bit. First, let's resolve this siege. Okay, so we don't have a siege marker. Bad weather did not delay the attack. What we do now is these nobles enter the fortification. They've successfully captured it, and we've taken control of Edward of Westminster. And the only way this could fail from here, really, aside from uh, bad weather delays attack is if the nobles you were attacking with were all killed by this card if that happens then you've got no one to move into the fortification you've just attacked and you have to move in if you've got no one left then nobles are killed and it's the end of the show but there we are we've got 200 troops moved in with our two nobles they don't all have to go in, so if we wanted to, we could leave one of these outside. Okay, it's up to us, maybe to discourage Ashby from coming out and sitting in this field. So we could, if we want to, or we could put them all inside, it's up to us. We're going to put everyone inside, keeping them nice and secure from our rivals. But also, if a plague card comes out, remember this was used for resolving combat, so you ignore that bit, but when it's used for the event phase, it would be a plague. Note that Cardigan and Swansea are now safe from plague, but Coventry is still vulnerable to plague. If plague comes out, it would kill one noble sitting inside this town. So if we only had one in there, then it would kill that one noble. If we've got two in there, well, at least then if it kills, plague kills one, we've got, we've got somebody else, right? So there's lots of different reasons why you might or might not put all or some of your nobles in a captured town. But that's it, that's done its job. Neither Scroop or Holland are involved. So that goes to the discard pile. And because we've taken control of a Lancastrian royal piece, we grab their card. So Edward of Westminster, take this card. There's two sides. There's crowned and uncrowned. So Edward of Westminster is currently uncrowned. And you'll note, so on this card, you have the order of succession. Edward is bottom, so Henry VI is top, then Margaret of Anjou. So we can't crown Edward until Henry is dead and Margaret is dead. And then Edward of Westminster is next in line. So we take Edward, um, and you can see it's the uncrowned side, with, and it awards two prestige. So whichever is the most senior royal that you hold you'll get their prestige points. OK, 
okay, just one of them. But for us, it's just Edward. We only hold Edward. We get to prestige. Place that down here in Oscar's area. And we'll mark up those extra two prestige points. So Oscar's now on four. And that's it. The combat's concluded. This royal piece, Edward of Westminster, will now move with this stack. Okay, so at least one of these nobles has to be seem to be carrying this royal piece, either Pole, Duke of Suffolk, or Barclay. So we have to choose. Do we give him to Pole or Barclay? I'm going to place him here with Pole. Okay, so all cards are allocated. Now we can hold crown cards in our hand, and we'll come to that next. Before we do, let's just think, this was obviously a siege where there, were, there was no defending noble, but if Hastings was in there and we had enough troops to dominate and win the siege, a couple of extra things would happen. First off, the defending noble or nobles are captured by the attacker. Okay, So this would be captured by Oscar and his faction. And one of the, this is a crown card, this one, this is a major siege. If we win a major siege, a major siege is one which involves office holding nobles on both sides. In this case, it was one sided. There are only nobles attacking, no nobles defending. But if there were nobles defending and they were captured, then the winning player takes this major siege, which awards one prestige. And again, it's a crown card. You have to assign it to one of the two nobles that were involved in the successful attack. OK. And what about these captured nobles? Well, we could, if we wish, ransom it back to the player we captured it from. They just place it back in its home castle. It keeps any titles and offices and any like, of these prizes, major siege that it was holding prior to the, to the siege. But anything else, so towns, mercenaries, ships, bishops, those cards, they go to the victor, okay? Unless they want to have some kind of negotiation. Remember, this is a bit of a negotiation game. So you can ransom this back, but take some of their crown cards as plunder, apart from office title and these prize cards. Uh, remember, with bishops, you can only hold one per noble. So if there's any that you capture and you haven't got room for, then you just discard them back to the crown deck discard. But the rest, so mercenaries, towns, ships, they they just get shared out amongst your nobles how you see fit. Okay. The other option is that instead of ransoming it back and sending it back to its home castle, you execute the poor noble. So you capture it and then you put it under the sword. No, you don't want it to go back to the defeated faction. And unless they've got something to bargain with, why would you? And we'll talk about exchanging cards, crown cards uh, in a bit, but we'll come to that later. But, you know, negotiations can be had, but more than likely you're going to just execute this noble. They're removed from play, they're out of the game, their noble card goes. But any offices and titles they had, they're now vacant, so they go in the Chancery. Okay, Someone has to be the Earl of Richmond, someone has to be Chancellor of England. So those offices would go up in the Chancery, and they could get handed out during a Parliament phase. Okay, remember, Chancery gets distributed. This is when, when you have a Parliament, you assign new titles and offices to nobles. But Hastings, if executed, is out of the game. Okay, so there are consequences to major sieges. Okay, now we've won Coventry. Coventry is currently neutral. So we place a control marker on it. We've actually won control of Coventry now. So this is a friendly town as far as we're concerned. Okay, we've captured it. If we captured it from a rival, then we'd be taking their Remember, town cards will be part of the spoils of stealing this from another noble. If the noble wasn't present and we capture Coventry, we take the Coventry card from them and give it to one of our nobles. If the Coventry card's in the discard pile, we grab it from there, give it to one of our nobles. If it's in play anyway, if anyone's got it, you immediately take it. But Coventry's going to be somewhere in that deck as it goes. And when it gets drawn, Coventry pops up. You holler and say, give me Coventry, and then it gets handed over. It's, I mean, it could be held secretly by someone. They have to give it up. Okay, that's the combat phase over. We'll look at 
battles shortly in our guide to king making we've covered the first two pages and then we've got the battle of thetford which is coming up so we'll set that up in a little while but first let's finish off oscar's turn because after combat phase we would have parliament phase but there's no clamor for parliament so we skip past that then we'd have coronation phase if we control the senior surviving member of one of the two houses we could be potentially crowning them we don't at the moment only edward is controlled and he's bottom of the line of succession so we'll skip coronation phase and we go to the end of turn phase and it's at this point once the prestige victory tiles out and in play it's at that point we would then check to see if you've got enough prestige points for victory incidentally if you're in an alliance remember we said in a four player game a single faction needs 11 prestige points an alliance of two factions needs 15 points if you're in an alliance you share the victory okay so it's, it's an allied victory you win together but assuming the game continues then the next thing you do is draw two crown cards and we draw an office marshal of england and a noble howard we put these in our hand the rules say at the end of the turn we have to discard one card from our hand so if we already had cards in our hand we could be discarding one of those instead so there is a potential to keep both cards drawn if we have other cards to discard but for the moment we don't have to decide just yet because if you want to you can do a little repositioning any nobles that are sitting in a fortification you can push them out into the open field and there is a reason for this and that's because there's a chance of plague right now we already know that cardigan and swansea they're not going to come up again because we've seen the card it's been discarded cardigan and swansea are safe but if we wanted to we could essentially take our two nobles and royal piece and push them out into the field leave Coventry with its garrison of 200 but unprotected by our nobles remember there's four more events to be seen before we have a chance to act again if a plague comes up in Coventry we're going to potentially lose one of our nobles but no we decide to take the risk and this is part of the game it's a big part of the game we're going to keep our nobles where they're safe from well, safer from attack in the garrison town of Coventry okay now, aside from that, before we get to discard, we might want to just have a discussion with other players. OK, remember, we've got allies, we've got enemies, we've got discussions and trading to be had. So we could discuss with other players, trade for cards in hand, play cards from our hand, declare alliances, end alliances, transfer cards between nobles or even execute some royal pieces. We could execute Edward now, for example, if we wanted to. Okay, so end of turn, we can execute royal pieces we control. You know, maybe we decide to ally with De Vere's faction. De Vere says, I'm going to get Henry VI, execute Edward, and I'll be your ally. I'll give you 20 Scots archers to help defend Coventry. You know, I'll go and grab Henry. Then we've got the single soul crown king. Edward is no more. You know, you can make all those kind of negotiations. You can't transfer offices. You can't transfer titles. You can transfer you can transfer bishops if you wish bishoprics archbishops those are tradable but nobles titles offices are untransferable you also can't trade these prize cards all right you can't win a major siege and then give that prestige to somebody else that prestige is decided by the people the prestige is yours it's not transferable now there is an exception when you can transfer offices between nobles and that's when those nobles are attending parliament but will come to parliament later if you do want to transfer crown cards that are assigned to nobles between nobles they have to be in the same open field or fortified location okay within an area but cards in hand oh well that's different if you've got cards in hand and they could even be nobles offices titles right? if they're in your hand that's a tradable cards attached to nobles are called transfers right so nobles offices titles are not transferable other cards are if you're in the same fortified location or open field trades of any cards in your hand is open season okay so there's tons of wheeling and dealing to be had during those times all right so once we've finished we've finished our politicking and we've decided whether to leave our nobles in or outside our castles then we can decide we got to throw one card from our hand we have to it's mandatory you can't keep them um, 
And Oscar, well, Marsha Lingen is really tempting. And it's good to have another noble, and we don't have anywhere to place this right now, but I don't know, it's tempting, it's tempting. Uh, there's always a chance that we'll grab another noble later. Okay, so Oscar's decided to keep the Marshal of Lingen. Now, they can't play it, they're just going to keep that in their hand. Right, face down, hidden. This is unknown information. Now, other players are thinking, is what exactly is that card? You know? And it gives them a little bit of leverage. That's uh, so Howard. And he's going face up in the discard pile. So everyone knows now Howard's gone. And his castle down at Farnham is not going to block the road. No one's, no one's going to control this. It will remain a neutral castle. And castles have a garrison of 100. They protect up to 300 troops. It might be a strategic point between London and Southampton controlling this road. Who knows? But that's it. We've ended Oscar's turn. Play finally passes to the next player. And remember, they're going to draw an event card. They're going to move their pieces. They're going to do any combat. Then they're going to potentially do Parliament, Coronation, and then end of turn. Right, And so it goes around. Before we begin the Battle of Thetford, there are a few little things I wanted to cover off. It's Talbot's turn, so they begin, as usual, they draw an event card. Let's just see how some things play out. So they've draw, drawn a Peasant Revolt. We've got Scroop to Mazam and Ross to Helmsley. Neither of those are in play, right? So let's give Scroop to, to our faction, Pole's faction. Scout through the deck. Okay, here's Scroop. So we'll assume that Pole's faction has Scroop. So what does this card do? Scroop to Mazam in 4F. 4F is up here. Scroop goes there and is placed inside the fortification. If Scroop for some reason had more troops than can be accommodated by a castle, a castle will protect up to 300. So if for some reason if they had more than 300, they'd have to be played outside in the field. If, let's say, they've been sent to Skipton next door, Skipton is controlled by an enemy faction, Talbot's faction, then again, they would have to be placed in the field outside. If they got sent to Lancaster here, which is controlled by a Poles faction, then again, they're good to go in. But like castles, if they exceed the 400 capacity, they have to go outside in the field. So be sensitive to that. When nobles are being pushed and pulled about, you must stick by the rules. Another exception is, I don't know, for some reason, let's say Scroop was over here on the Isle of Man. They'd taken the, the Plymouth and docked here at Douglas. There's actually four such islands. We've got the Isle of Man, you've got Anglesey, you've got the Isle of Wight down here, and you've got Calais. If the noble is in one of these locations away from mainland England, then they can't be called. Or if indeed they were sailing away out at sea on a ship, they can't be called, they're stuck where they are. Okay. And as we discussed previously, if they're in a besieged location, okay, so if they have one of these besieged tokens, they can't respond to the core, to a location from a peasant revol revolt. So yeah, look out for those exceptions. Incidentally, this number in the top left corner here, this number one, that's the number of times a noble is called by events. So for Scroop, it's one time, just one time. Okay, These numbers in the bottom right, that's the variance for classic kingmaker. You can ignore that, Lords 1, it's votes in Parliament. Note too that when a noble's called, all the cards they control, any royal pieces they control, they come with them. So we've done the event, now you do the movement. So we're looking at Talbot's nobles here. What would be nice is if we could unite all of their forces. And I'm just trying to spot a, a town possibly. I mean, they've got 200 units together. Is there a town they can all get together? Well, using regional movement, we could move Talbot here to outside Chester. Now Chester's neutral. We can't go in, we have to sit in the field outside. Uh, Cromwell here 
could then use regional movement, stay within the region and stack with Talbot. That's 160. I think Talbot's got 60. Cromwell has 100. And then we've got Clifford up here. Now Clifford can't get to Chester. Um, he's not on a road. No, Chester is on a road and they control part of it here through South Wingfield. The Richard Duke of York is a possible target. But how about instead we move, we can use regional movement to head into, say, Preston. And then Talbot decides an early play of the free move card. So free move, discarded. And unites his troops outside Chester. Now Chester's neutral. There's no nobles there, so it has a garrison of 200. Remember, on the first turn, we can't attack other nobles anyway. But with 200 troops now, we can siege attack the town of Chester. Now, one thing I wanted to point out is just to add to these transfers. Now that these nobles are in the same open field, you can transfer, remember, non-titles, non-offices between them. So, for example, Talbot might have thought, do you know what? I don't want those crossbowmen with Clifford, I want them with Crom with um, Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury. So they can move them over like that. Now Shrewsbury's got 90. It makes a little difference at this stage, but just know that you can, when you're in the same field, transfer crown cards between nobles. Right? And that's just how you do it. And that's at any time, on your turn, on another player's turn, doesn't matter. Combat now. So we're going to assault this town. We're going to siege attack this town. If you want to, put a little token on to say that's what you're doing. Remember, we're looking for anything other than bad weather delays attack. That's good. Our siege was successful. Now we decide. So at least one of them has to come in. Let's say we're going to put Clifford in there and leave the other two out in the field. As it goes, we've got a bit of bad luck at the same time. We've got killed Talbot and Howard. Well, we have Talbot. Okay, Talbot is killed. Although the siege attack is successful, we place a control marker on Chester. We do now lose Talbot. So how does this work? Let's just see this in action. They've got two towns, a ship and a company of crossbowmen. Okay, so they're all lost. They don't have any offices, but if they had, they would go in the chancery. Now, any Cards like Major Siege, Major Battle, any of these prestige awards, they would go back in this space. City cards, they go back in the city card space and that will lose one prestige. So you adjust the prestige. So in this case, they go from two down to one. Any locations mentioned on these cards become neutral again. So Bristol becomes neutral. We'll move that control marker. And Swansea is lost, which is a shame. Swansea, we already know, is safe from plague. If any nobles in our faction or allies were in those locations that we've just lost, they would then be forced out. They'd be forced out into the field, remember, because they're now in a neutral location. Everything else, including the noble itself, goes in the discard pile. Now, keep account of how many cards you lost. We've lost one, two, three, four, four cards. Don't count the city of Bristol. That didn't get discarded. That went back here. Okay, so this wouldn't count. This wouldn't count. A royal card wouldn't count. How many cards went to the discard pile? It could be that they didn't go to the discard pile, but they got handed to another player. They would still count. Okay, so it's these cards don't count. Other crown cards do. Right. So four is the total count of cards lost. And that's important because every time a noble is lost, remember excluding these cards, the number of cards lost is compensated for by a rule called rally to the cause. We've lost a noble, our faction rallies to the cause. For every two cards discarded this way, we draw one card from the crown deck. So we discarded four cards, we draw two cards. If we discarded five cards, we draw two cards. If we discarded through six cards, we discard three, okay? So it's for every whole two cards, we draw one. Make sense? All right. We draw two cards and they go to our hand. So they drew Percy 
and Duke of Exeter. So there's your kind of rally to the cause, compensation, if you like. So it means even if you do get hit hard, you lose nobles, you've got a little bit of compensation. You've got a way to kind of recover and come back from it. Now, obviously, we lose Clifford. Clifford is only one card. There's no compensation to be had. If we lose Cromwell, Cromwell's holding three cards. OK, Cromwell is title in his office. That will be three cards. That will be one card compensation. Okay, Cromwell would go to the discard, the office, and the title would go to Chancery. Okay. So that's the rally to the cause rule. And obviously, Talbot himself is removed from the map. All right. Okay, not wanting to lose another piece to plague, Talbot decides to, after drawing his cards, move Clifford out to the field. Draws two cards. Okay, and now has to discard one. Now we could do a little bit of politicking, of course. Now you might think now might be a good time for Talbot's faction to start thinking about an alliance, maybe get some strength, perhaps give one of these cards, trade it away and say, let's form an alliance, maybe with the blue portcullis player. But you can't start making alliances until at least one faction has taken control of the head of either house. So at the moment that's Henry VI or Richard Duke of York. Until one of these two have been claimed, there's no alliances, everyone's on their own. But once an alliance has been formed, you're off and running, and then nobles from the allied factions, let's say blue and yellow, did get together. They now operate as a team. Okay, Their nobles can stack together, they can attack together, they can move together, they can claim victory together. But they kind of act like one faction. Okay, So the, only, the alliance as a whole only earns prestige for the most senior royal piece that they control, and they can only control pieces from one royal house. And they can take control of a royal piece from another house, but they have to execute one or the other. So the ally works like a single faction, and they win and lose together. As it goes, they've reached the end of the turn now. They need to get rid of a card, and I think they will throw away Herbert. Although that might have been a nice piece to trade away to Beaufort, the blue faction. Um, yeah, it doesn't quite fit these I mean these this is Percy Strong, Mowbray Strong, and they've got Duke of Exeter as a title that they could give to someone like Clifford as well. So Herbert is being thrown. Okay. So there we go. We've learned a little bit more about that. Right, we're just about ready for Battle of Thetford. But let's see what would have happened if there was now another turn. It's both at factions turn they would be drawing an event card and there we go. Plague in Nottingham, Leicester and Coventry. So Plague works a little different in Kingmaker 2. It's less harsh. Nottingham, there's no one in Nottingham. Leicester, there's no one in Leicester, but there is someone in Coventry. Okay, So these three towns are being hit. Now we've got two nobles and a royal piece in Coventry. First off, all royal pieces in the town are killed. Okay, so a good reason to have taken Edward and stuck him in the field at the end of Pole's turn. So Edward of Westminster is killed, removed from the game. The royal card is removed from the game as well. Prestige is gone, the piece is gone, that royal piece is out. The value of all royal pieces has suddenly gone up because there's one royal heir down. Now every faction in the town loses a noble. Okay, So if there were allies here, different nobles from different factions, they'd each lose a noble. But you can't lose more than one noble from your faction. Okay, That's the change. But it's not a free choice. It has to be the noble with the highest troop strength. So whoever's strongest is going to go. If you've got two nobles equally strong, you can choose between them. Ignore regional bonuses. So we've got 80, 100 on pole and 100 on Barclay. We would get to choose. And then you lose the noble in exactly the same way. Prestige goes, you get compensation. Okay, so let's assume they chose to lose Barclay. And they would lose these. They'd go to the Chancery. They'd lose Lancaster and Barclay. They'd lose four cards and get two compensation. Now a mid-event 
although these two nobles are in the same open field, you can't start transferring stuff. You can't say, well, let's let's push Lancaster over to Pole before we lose Barclay. Okay. You can't transfer cards when you're resolving an event. It's too late once you've drawn it. Okay, so that's the change on plagues and how they work. All right, let's um let's rewind that. Let's put Edward back. And instead, let's go back to the Guide to Kingmaking and set up the Battle of Thetford. Thetford is over here in the East Anglia region. <laughs>